All right, so everybody should have a handout. I've got a couple extra if someone needs one. I know we're sharing. I only printed about 15 because I didn't know how many would actually come this evening. But my apologies for the quality of the printer. That's a good quality Mid-South printer that prints about 1,000 pages a day. So it is uh, good quality, if not I mean. But anyway, we'll just make do with it. So tonight we're going to pick up where we left off last week. The next section in the Confession covers... The, the idea of covenant, that God is a covenant God, a God who operates by way of covenant. And so this evening, we want to think about the biblical covenants that God has used to unfold His plan of redemption. And so I want to begin, though, by picking up where we left off last week. Last week, we were talking about sin and about the fall of humanity. Right? And you all remember that story from Genesis chapter 3. right? Sin entered into God's good creation. Right? God had declared on day six that He had made the man, put him in the garden, and it was very good. Right? Everything was, was rolling according to God's divine plan. It was bringing Him glory. It was blessed and beautiful, and everything was as it should be. And then in chapter 3, sin entered the picture. Sin corrupted God's good creation. Sin polluted not only man, but also the created world. And, and, it became, and it, so there, now there's a problem, isn't there? God had created something good. But now there's a problem. It's stained. It's polluted. It's fallen. And yet, we do have the promise of redemption. The, the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that says to the woman, um, talking about the woman and the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, he says, His seed will bruise your heel, and your seed will bruise his head. And that's the Philip Powers uh, paraphrase there. But that is the first gospel. It is the promise that the seed of the woman would, would conquer and defeat the seed of the serpent or the enemy uh, of humanity, the devil. Right? So we have this, 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 these two realities. Right? A good creation that is corrupted by sin. And we have a promise of redemption. And so we don't know how that's going to play out. How is God going to resolve these two tensions? How is He going to redeem something that's hopelessly corrupted and decaying because of sin and death? That is the question that we want to ask this evening. And so, those are preliminary considerations. Those are the first two points. Because I just wanted us to, to be reminded of kind of where we are in the story uh, in light of our discussion last week. But under point C, I wanted just to take just a moment to talk about the idea of a covenant. Right? Our God, we're going to see this evening, is a covenant God. He uses but covenants to unfold His plan of redemption, to fulfill His promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So He is a covenant God. So we need to have a clear understanding of, of exactly what a covenant is. So let's just have some discussion here. What, when, when, what comes to mind or, or when you have, hear the word covenant? Or can you define what a covenant is? Like a contract. I like that. Somebody else said something. Promise. Okay, it has some promises. Right? Some vows, some obligations, some responsibilities, and some consequences. Right? We, in our current world, we usually think of marriage as a covenant. Right? A marriage covenant is an agreement between a man and a wife that they would uh, remain committed to one another, that they would persevere with one another, that they would serve and love one another in spite of all circumstances, and that they would remain committed to, the, to each other. So marriage is a covenant. It is a commitment. It is an agreement. Right? And so this idea of covenant was a very common idea in the ancient world. Right? This was a very common way for, for nations and for kings and for even peers to make agreements. Right? To make a contractual obligation. Right? So I think the word contract is probably the best uh, definition for us to think about when we think of covenant. Okay? And so in the ancient world, you could have a covenant between two people that were the same social status. If we were peers, if they are the same standing in the society, we could make an agreement. Right? And we could have obligation, mutual obligations toward one another in terms of contractual obligations. More often than not, you could also have a covenant between someone who was a higher status and someone who was a lower status. And that's why you have there the suzerain vassal treaty. That's I put that in your, in your uh, parentheses there. Suzerain just means king or ruler. Right? And a vassal is their servants. And so often in the ancient world, these kings would make covenants with their people that would spell out these are the responsibilities of the king. He's going to provide for you, protect you, keep you safe. And and these are the responsibilities of this vassal. They're going to work the land and, and give a portion of it back to him and so forth for his, for his protection and provision. Right? So that's the way it works. And if we look at, if we were to do a deep dive on the book of Deuteronomy, we would see that the book of Deuteronomy is actually structured 
uh, similarly to the way these ancient covenants were actually structured. So it's very interesting. But this is the idea that God uses agreements like this. He binds himself by way of covenant or contract in terms of his plan of redemption. And so scholars of looking over the Bible have identified about, I've identified eight here that we will talk about. Um, but several covenants here that God has used to unfold the plan of redemption. So under point two, I call these the theological covenants. Okay, they're logical because they're logically presumed or theologically presumed. We don't have anywhere in the Bible that it talks about a covenant of redemption, for example. We don't have anywhere in the Bible that it talks about a covenant of works, for example. These are theologically presumed or logically presumed covenants that are kind of like the way um, we, we define the doctrine of Trinity. Right? The idea of Trinity is not found in the Bible, but its evidence is there. And so we deduce the idea of Trinity from the Bible. So this is kind of the same way here with these ideas. So point A, the covenant of redemption. Okay, what is the covenant of redemption? What is meant here by covenant of redemption? So I put three points there. And all of these quotations are taken from Ligonier. You guys are familiar with that, with that uh, online re resource. So again, all of these are taken from that, those resources. But the covenant of redemption, it's called a covenant in as much as the plan involves two or more parties. Right? To have an agreement or to have a contract, you have to have more than one party. Right? You can't make a covenant with yourself. That, that makes sense, right? But this covenant of redemption is not a covenant between God and humans. It is more uh, a covenant among the persons of the God specifically between the Father and the Son. So under the covenant of redemption, if you want to look at uh, with the second point here, the covenant of redemption is the agreement that is made between the members of the Trinity in order to bring us salvation. Under this covenant, the Father plans redemption and sends the Son in order to save His people. The Son agrees to be sent and to do the work necessary to save the elect. And the Spirit agrees to apply the work of Christ to us by sealing us unto salvation. Okay, so again... Not clearly defined this way in the Bible, but when we look at the text of scriptures, it seems to be that God, in eternity past, made an agreement with himself. Right? That this is the way we're going to save humanity. We're going to send the Son to die and rise again. And then we're going to use the, the Spirit is going to regenerate hearts and apply the work of Christ. And so this is God's eternal plan. It was always God's plan A. This is important. Right? God didn't have a plan B. Right? Even when he began to create, and we've talked about this for several weeks now, even when he began to create, even when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, he didn't go, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? Right? This was set in motion from eternity past when God said, how am I going to bring myself most glory and reveal myself uh, in the trueness of who I am? He said, in order to do that, I will have to send my son to die for humanity. That's, that's why uh, in Acts it says that the son was crucified before the foundations of the world. Okay, so we know that this this cross, this gospel, this idea of, of substitutionary atonement, the work of Christ was always God's plan A. And so here the theological presumption is that there was an agreement in the in the eternity past in the Trinity among themselves for how to work this out. Okay, well, point three, the covenant of redemption is a corollary to the doctrine of Trinity. Like the word Trinity, the Bible nowhere explicitly mentions it. The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible, but the concept of Trinity is affirmed throughout Scripture. Likewise, the phrase covenant of redemption does not occur explicitly in Scripture, but the concept is heralded throughout. Okay, that's why I said theological, theologically presumed. Right? Not clearly stated, but deduced from the evidence of Scripture that this was always God's plan to redeem His people by His Son through the Spirit. Okay? And so that's kind of the, uh, the foundation, if you will, of God's redeeming work. The story of how He will redeem this covenant of redemption. Under point B, then, some theologians will talk about a covenant of works. I have the definition for you there. The covenant of works refers to the covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in their pristine purity before the fall, in which God promised them blessedness contingent upon their obedience to His command. In other words, as long as they kept the command and did not eat of the fruit, then they could have lived in the garden and continued to enjoy God's blessedness. They go on to say, after the fall, the fact that God continued to promise redemption to creatures who had violated the covenant of works... That ongoing promise of redemption is defined as the covenant of grace. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But again, just trying to define what was the agreement, what were the stipulations, what were the conditions for Adam and Eve in the garden? Right? If they would have continued to live faithfully, continued to not eat of the tree that they were commanded to not eat of, then presumably God would have allowed them to continue to live in the garden. Right? That's why it's called a, con a covenant of works. They would obey and he would bless. Right? That's very simple. It's easy to understand there. Okay? Again, not affirmed and not labeled that way in the scriptures, but again, deduced from the evidence of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Okay? And then point C, the uh, covenant of grace. 
The covenant of grace, the essence of the covenant of grace is the same throughout the Old and New Testaments. God saves sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But its historical administrations have varied by time and place. Okay, so again, this is just a way of identifying how God interacts with His creation now, post-fall. How will He redeem? How he, will He save now that sin has entered into the picture and corrupted everything? Right? And so now we see it's a covenant of grace. And we're going to talk about the historical covenants in just a minute, but I would say all of them are an outworking of that agreement. Okay? So again, these are not explicitly labeled so in the Scriptures, but they are theologically presumed and may be helpful for understanding the mind of God and how these things have worked in terms of planning human redemption. I will tell you that I struggle with affirming these wholeheartedly simply because they are not named so in the Bible. This is just a weakness for me in terms of these specific covenants. I understand what's being argued for. I understand the, the value of trying to explain it in this, in this way. But given the lack of actual evidence in the Bible for these covenants, I find it somewhat less than convincing. But you don't have to agree with me on that. That's the way it's been thought of in terms of theological history, church history. Okay? So again, those are the theological uh, covenants, if you will. But we do have some very clear covenants in the Bible that we need to talk about. Some very clear covenants that are named so and identified as such and help unfold the story of the Bible. And this is really important. This is why the idea of covenant is so important for us tonight, is that it helps us understand the overarching story of the Bible. That's why I put it at the top, on the covenants and the story of redemption. How has God unfolded the biblical story from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation chapter 22? God's story, the, the meta narrative, the overarching narrative of Scripture, is a story of covenants. Okay? And so that's one way of thinking about the continuity or the thread that goes through all the Bible, and the golden thread, so to speak, that holds the story together. Right? We think about covenants. And so these are probably most of these covenants you're going to be familiar with. But let's open our Bibles, if you've got them, to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. We're going to look at the covenant that God made with Noah. Okay, so by way of recap, who can tell me briefly, summarize the story of Noah? In just a few simple words. Story of Noah? Yeah. Uh, the main kind of... Yes. What's that? Flood, dry, rainbow. Okay. What were you going to say, Craig? Uh, man was evil. Yep. God wipes out everybody but eight. Right. It starts over with those those folks. That's right. It says Noah found grace in his eyes. That does not mean Noah wasn't evil. Because God is the of God and all men are evil. That's right. And so why God chose Noah, I have no idea. But I'm glad he chose someone. Yeah. He said, wouldn't it, um, could be wrong here, in that, didn't God say to, like, get this animal, get that animal, like, get them Yes. Things? Yeah. So that is part of the story, isn't it? That God determined because the thoughts of men were only evil always. We read that into the first part of Genesis chapter 6. Because sin had so corrupted God's creation, God determined that judgment was necessary. And He determined to judge the world by flood. And yet in His grace, which is what you said, Paul, and exactly right, God chose Noah and his family to be saved. And he, he commanded Noah to build an ark. He commanded him to save seven of the clean animals, two each of the unclean animals. Um, by the way, your children's stories are wrong. It wasn't two each of every animal. It was seven of the clean, two of the unclean. But, God, but he saved those animals in the ark. They were all delivered. Remember, they floated on the waters for 40 days and 40 nights. And then eventually the waters receded and they were able to come out of the ark. Okay? And you guys are pretty familiar with that story, right? That's familiar Sunday school stuff. So let's pick <coughs> excuse me, this story up <coughs> excuse me, in Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, it says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Let's just stop right there. Does that command sound familiar to you? From where? Huh? Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 is where it is. The creation mandate. This is a reaffirmation of God's original instruction to Adam and Eve in the garden. 
Now that Adam or that Noah and his family are the only human beings on the earth, God reaffirms his creation instruction, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it. Because, as we know from the book of Leviticus, blood is a symbol of life, and life belongs to God. And so, therefore, I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal or from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed. For God made humans in his own image. But you, be fruitful and multiply. Thank you. <clears throat> and fill the earth. Verse 8, Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, Understand that I am establishing my covenant. There's our word. I'm establishing my covenant with you and, and your descendants after you, and with every living creature and birds and so forth. Verse 11, I will establish my covenant with you that I will never again will every creature be wiped out by the flood waters. There will never again be a flood to destroy this earth. In verse 12, God said, This is the sign of the covenant I'm making between you and you, every living creature, a covenant for all future generations. Right? That's a very important line. I have placed my bow in the clouds, and it will be a symbol of the covenant between me and the earth. When I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures, and water will never again become a flood to destroy every creature. Okay? You get the idea. Okay? So God is entering into an agreement with Noah. Right? The agreement is, I will not flood the earth in judgment again. You will be fruitful and multiply. You will. Um, you can eat anything, but don't eat the blood. Don't don't kill. That's that's uh, that's precluded here. But God says, I'm going to make this covenant. I'm obligating myself to you by this rule that I will not flood the earth in judgment again. It's only one problem with that for 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 our for our understanding, right? That sin still exists, right? God said, I'm going to flood the earth and wipe out sin, and so He did that. But then, even there in chapter 9, after Noah and his family come out of the ark, guess what? Still sin. Right? Look down in, verse, in chapter 9, picking it up here in verse 20 of chapter 9. Noah, as a man of the soil, began by planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak and placed it over their um, over both their shoulders and walking backward they covered their father's nakedness and their faces were turned away they did not see their father naked when Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him he said Canaan is what cursed Canaan is cursed but he also said blessed be the Lord God of Shem let Canaan and so forth and so here is a problem hang on just a minute Ryan two seconds sin still exists curse still exists Right? There's still a problem here that has not been fully dealt with. And so in, in, even though God made a promise, I will not judge the earth by flood, the problem of sin still existed. And so, yes, we have God's grace in the promise of the, the um, rainbow, but it's also a promise that one day I will deal with sin again. You see that here? Even in promising Noah that he would not flood the earth again, he's saying, and yet I will deal with sin. And that's implied here and not stated, but it is a part of this idea here. Yes, Ryan, what were you going to say? So we're not saying that, this is not saying that there was technically a second fall, but they were not in perfection here. They were not in perfection, that's correct. That's right. Yeah, so this is, but this is part of God's renewal of His plan, or continuation, if you will, of His plan of redemption. That He is still intending to... Redeem humanity to, to deal with sin and so forth and so on. Yes? Uh, okay, I might have missed it. And I've never, I guess, picked it up. Uh, where was the sin in that? Was it like the drinking, the nakedness, or the shame? <clears throat> yeah, um, it's not exactly clear exactly what the sin is here. Um, it could be the drunkenness. It could be the shame that, uh, that Ham, or Canaan rather didn't, didn't honor his father. So there's some other things that are going on here in terms of how Canaan deals with him versus or Ham rather, and how the other sons deal with him. All right, there's some differences there, but there, there definitely is a fallenness to this story, isn't there? Is yeah, that fair? Yeah, because Adam and Eve were cool being like naked, and then right. when they sinned, they wanted to be covered up. Right, that's a good connection. Adam and Eve were naked, and they were not ashamed. And yet after they fell, they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. And here Noah is naked, and it's a shameful thing. That's why his sons come in and cover him. Right? So that is part of that, part of that fallenness of the story as well, isn't it? 
Okay? So, I just want you to see that this is the beginning of God's plan of redemption here for Noah. Any questions about the Noah, Noahic? Is how you would say that? The Noahic covenant. I think it's important to point out because um, we are human with sinful nature that we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to become either uh, without law, living life as whatever, or if I'm obeying, then God accepts me. But Noah was accepted by grace. It tells us that previous to the ark. Mm -hmm. And after the ark, Noah got drunk. That's sin. Yep. Okay? But it didn't separate him from God. That's it's right. Grace. That's right. And we got to remember this. It, Noah wasn't redeemed because of his works, nor was he kept because of his work, but it was with the continual yeah. keeping of God yeah. that kept him. And so as we walk this life, I thank God for a drunk saver. Yeah. Because it reminds me I can be forgiven. That's right. And, and we're going to see that in all of these covenants we talked about. is grace, as we talked about a while ago, God's op operative principle in His interactions with humanity is grace. It's always grace forward. It's always grace first in terms of His plan of redemption. And so that is a thread that runs through all of these covenants. Let's turn over to the book of Genesis uh, chapter 15 and look at the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant actually starts in Genesis chapter 12. Um, I have those references for you. We're not going to read those. But in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord calls Abram out of the land of Ur and says, I will bless you and I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. I'll make you a name great and make you the father of a great nation. And I will give you a land. So it's land, seed, and blessing are the, are the, the components of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? That's in Genesis chapter 12. But in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham's got a problem. Do you remember what Abram's problem was? Why was it a problem? He didn't have no kids. So God, man, you know, God, you promised me that I was going to be the father of many nations, and yet I don't have any children. So how am I going to be the father of many nations? And that's the problem in Genesis chapter 15. Abraham is complaining to God that he has no offspring, and a slave that was born in his house is going to be his heir. Pick it up in verse 4. The word of the Lord came to Abram. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky. Count the stars if you're able to count them. Then he said, your offspring will be that numerous. Now, can you put yourself in Noah's shoes? Abraham's shoes, rather. Abraham's old. His wife is old. And he, God just told him, your descendants, your seed, your children, are going to be as numerous as these stars. That's a crazy thought for Abraham in his old age. But verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. It's a very famous verse. Going on here, picking it up in, uh, in verse 9, God said to him, Bring me three-year-old cow, three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, turtle dove, and young pigeon. So he brought all these pieces to him, all these to him, and he cut them in half and laid the pieces opposite each other, but he did not cut the birds in half. Birds of prey came down to the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly great terror and darkness descended on him. Then the Lord said, For certain, know this for certain, your offspring will be resident aliens, etc., etc. Verse 17, When the sun had set, it was dark. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Canaanites, Hethites, Perizzites, Rephaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergeshites, and Jebusites. I'll just do yeah. Okay. The point here is that this is a formal covenant ceremony in the ancient world. They would split the animals, and the two parties of the covenant would walk down between them. What does that signify? A uh, handshake, essentially, the way we would think of it. It does signify a handshake, Covenant. but it's a little bit more serious than that. Oh, yeah. Let that be done to me. That's right. Essentially, when the parties walked through the split animals, they, would, they were saying, if I don't keep my part of the bargain, let what was done to these animals be done to me. That's how serious a covenant is. They're taking upon themselves the penalty of death, essentially, if they were to fail in their covenantal obligations. What's important about this story is that Abraham was asleep on the side of the road. Who walked between the animals? That's right. Symbolized by a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Right? God Himself walked through. So whose obligation is it then 
to keep the covenant. Not Abraham's. That's why this is a very important passage. What's the, what's the significance of this moment? That's a debated. Um, I will tell you that some people look at this passage and think that because there's a torch and a flaming fire pot, that this symbolizes the covenant of redemption that we talked about earlier, that this was father and son. I will tell you I'm not convinced by that argument because this is a particular reference to the covenant God was making with Abraham. That God was taking upon Himself the obligation of providing a son, providing these heirs, providing these descendants. So I, don't, I wouldn't read any Trinitarian kind of overtones into this passage. But I think these are just symbols that would have represented glory, divine kinds of uh, presence in that sense. So I want to back up a second. Yeah. He said he believed God and was counted unto him right. That's right. John chapter 6 says, uh, Abraham saw me and he rejoiced, right? So we know that Abraham understood that the promised child was actually a picture of the Redeemer. Uh -huh. and, and he understood that somehow. He saw my death. He saw me. Jesus said, Abraham yeah. saw me and rejoiced. What, what he's saying there is he saw me by faith and righteousness and that, that, that one day he would be redeemed. Now the importance here is that Abraham did believe, but like you and me, sometimes we get confused. Because when we don't see the fruition of this promise immediately, we go to works. Yep. Galatians, it says that there's Mount Sinai, right? Then uh -huh. Mount Zion. Right. There, there's uh, then it's Sarah. And, and there's Hagar. Hagar, right? Yeah. One's the law, one's grace. We've got to remember this. We've got to remember this yeah. because when we look at Abraham, he decided that he was going to do things by his own hands. And what did he get? He got an Ishmael. That's right. How many times have you and I decided we'd fight sin in our own strength? I did it for 11 years. I lost 11 years of my life. Mm -hmm. I lost 11 years of my life because I thought I'd fight strength sin in my yeah. own strength. I know this because God has brought the reality to my life that I've been doing that. Yeah. And what I'll tell you, I'll tell this to Pastor Steve today. I said, I had a lot of wood. Wood was the Word of God. I had a lot of the Word of God in me. But that wood got set on fire by the Holy Spirit. When I turned to Him for strength. Yeah. When I turned to Him for deliverance. And so Abraham, in his own strength, made an Ishmael. Yeah. How many Ishmaels have we made? Yeah. And that's, a, that's an important point, Paul, that Abraham is an exemplar of faith, isn't he? We go to Hebrews 11, we can read about the faith of Abraham. And yet Abraham's faith was weak. Yeah. At times he did not trust God. At times he lied about Sarah being his wife and told oh. the Pharaoh that he oh. was his sister. Right? And then, yes, he, he, he went into the agreement with Hagar and had Ishmael instead of trusting God to provide Isaac. But then there's also the story of, Ab of uh, Genesis chapter 22 yeah. when God told him to take Isaac to the top of the mountain and sacrifice him. He hesitate. He got up. Said, Son, That's right. Go. And then he says when they get up there and he's about to kill Isaac, what does he say? The Lord has provided. Jehovah Yireh. God has provided a lamb. By faith he knew. His, he That's had right. to raise Isaac up. That's right. Him. So point being that Abraham... Abraham, Abraham is, a, is a human being just like you and me. Yes. And his faith at times was strong and his faith at times was weak. But God made a promise. Mm, that's where it's at. And God kept his promise because Abraham did become the father of many nations. But and how this, many, How many Ishmaels do we have to make before we truly trust that promise? That's right. So, point being here that this is part of our story. Part of God's unfolding of the plan of redemption. Remember, it's through Abraham he said the nations of the world will be blessed. Right, and this is ultimately fulfilled in the seed of Abraham. Paul says not seeds plural, but seeds singular, who is Jesus Christ. Right? So again, this is part of God's plan of redemption moving forward. The Mosaic Covenant, I don't think we need to cover that. I think you guys are pretty clear on the Mosaic Covenant. Right? What is the Mosaic Covenant? Okay, maybe we do need to cut. No, I'm just kidding. What is, what is, what is the Mosaic Covenant? What I think of as the Ten Commandments, we would say that. Okay, the Ten Commandments are definitely part of it. Right. But even speaking more broadly, the Mosaic Covenant is the agreement that God made with the people of Israel. That if they would obey His law and keep His Torah, that they would be able to live in His land and enjoy His blessing. And that if they disobeyed His law and did not keep His Torah, then they would be kicked out and exiled from the land. All right, and you can read those passages in Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 24 that make it very clear. God says, this is the agreement I'm going to make with you. And the people respond, yes, we will obey your covenant. In Exodus 19 and in Exodus 24. And then, of course, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and 29, are the curses and the blessings that are spelled out. 
right? If you keep my covenant, these are the blessings you'll receive. And if you disobey my covenant, these are the cursings you will receive. And you can read this in your own time. But again, Mosaic Covenant, it was an agreement God made with the people of Israel, a promise that if they would do their end, He would do His end, essentially. He would bless them and let them live in His land, protect them and make them secure. If they would keep His land, His uh, law, but then they didn't, then they would be exiled. And of course, they were ultimately exiled. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And moving forward, the Davidic Covenant. You guys, we just read this. We just came through the Christmas season. This is an important passage for you to know. 2 Samuel chapter 7. We can turn there quickly. What is God's covenant with David? That's exactly right. Remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David's sad because he's like, I have not built a house for the Lord. And the Lord speaks to the prophet Nathan and he says, go to David. And he said, no, David, you're not going to build a house for me. And he says, David, I'm going to build a house for you. And your descendants will sit on the throne. And he says over here in verse, um, in verse 11, picking it up in the second part, the Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When the time comes, you will rest with your fathers. I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. He goes on in verse 15, But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, when I removed him from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. Forever. That's God's promise. You understand? It's an agreement that God obligated himself to, to the house, the lineage of David to preserve his line and set up his descendant as king forever. Now when you think about the Gospel of Matthew in the Christmas story, and particularly chapter 1, that genealogy passage that we all like to skip over, what does, God, or not, what does Matthew say about the genealogy of Jesus? Whose descendant was he? Two particular people in, in, that are important here. That's right. Who else? Yes, I'm going to go back further than that. That's right. Matthew is at particular pains in his genealogy to show that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham and a descendant of David. That's how God unfolded his plan of redemption. That's why the, the Gospels in particular are clear in, in affirming that Jesus is the son of David. Son of David is a messianic title, a kingly title, son of David. Okay? The genealogy, though we skip over them, it confirms that the Bible is the Word of God. That's right. Now most books start off what? Once upon a time. Long, long time ago, the land far away. But it actually starts off what? Genealogy. That's right. It tells us it's true. That's right. It's real. That's right. It's kept. Yep. I've kept it. It's real. Yep. So let's move quickly here. <clears throat> the New Covenant. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. I, t I said a while ago that the Mosaic Covenant had stipulations. If the people of Israel were to keep God's law, they would be allowed to stay in the land. If they had disobeyed God's law, they would have to be exiled from the land. Well, you guys know the story. They did not keep the law, and they were exiled from the land. The book of Hosea is a particularly vivid description of God's divorce of Israel. Right? How, do you break, how do you dissolve a covenant? Right. Well, if, it was, if it's a marriage covenant we're talking about, then we would use the concept of divorce. Right? So in, in Hosea, the prophet Hosea uses a very, that metaphor to describe how God is divorcing Israel for their unfaithfulness. And he also promises that God will renew his covenant with them. But the promise of a new covenant then <coughs> looks forward to a time when the broken Mosaic covenant would be fulfilled and renewed. So pick it up with me in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Jeremiah the prophet, again, Jeremiah is prophesying as the walls of Jerusalem are burning down. Jeremiah says, look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors on the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I am their master, he says. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. For I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. This is the promise. This is a paradigmatic passage. You need to nail it to the top of your foreheads. Okay, this is a very important passage for understanding the covenant that you and I now live under. This is a promise of our salvation. And you can see the references there. But in the, in the, in the Last Supper, when Jesus took the cup, what did He say? This is what? This is the new covenant. This is the what? This is the new covenant in my blood. Because covenants were ratified by what? Blood. And when Moses ratified the Mosaic covenant with the people of Israel, he sprinkled them with blood. And the new covenant was also ratified by blood, by the shed blood of the Son of God. And that's exactly the argument you would go read if you would go read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Okay. The, Can I read from Ezekiel on that real quick? Yeah, yeah. You want to read the Ezekiel 36 passage? Okay. God, Lord God, because you did all these things, these deeds of the brazen prostitutes, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square. You were not like a prostitute because you scorned pay, payment, adulterous wife who received strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but you gave your gifts to all your mother, bribing them to come to you from every kind of description. Yes. But if you go to the end of the chapter, this is where this confirms this stuff that he's talking about. There's a joyful statement that it, and I don't think it's found many places. It says in verse um, 59, For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done. You have despised the oath and breaking the covenant. So here we're talking about the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. You will remember your ways and be ashamed when you, you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger. And I give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. Here we go. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Then you may remember and be confounded, and never open your mouth again because of your shame. When I atone for you all, all that you have done, declares the Lord God. So yep. here you have, I, we read this passage of the prostitution. You're not a normal prostitute. You're paying people to sleep with you. Yep. And, and he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to silence you. I'm going to silence your shame. Yep. How many of you have guilt rise up and cry your name about your past? Yep. He says, I'm going to silence that. You know how I'm going to silence it? Because I'm going to love you through this everlasting yep. covenant. Yeah. Guys, we've got to hear that. What he's talking about is very powerful. Yeah. It's an everlasting covenant, not based upon what we've done, but what who he is. His That's right. Love for us. That's him. right. That's right. It's his love for That's us. Right. That's what he's saying to him. I'm gonna silence you. I'm gonna silence that shame. I know what it's like to walk in shame. Not be able to leave. I, I would get dressed and comb my hair without looking in the mirror because I was so ashamed because yeah. of my sin against the holy God. I was his child and I was sinning yep. against him. He silenced that shame. Yep. Jesus says, I take your shame. Yep. I take that shame on the cross. That's what he's talking yep. about right now. Yep. And that's why it's called grace. Amen. And we're going to talk about this just a minute in point four, but we'll talk about how the obligation to keep the covenant does not fall on us. Yes. It all falls on God. That's why he can say that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because he's made a, he's obligated himself. He's made a promise of himself and he always keeps his promises. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So here you see in these five covenants, the story of God's plan of redemption unfolding from Noah to Abraham to Moses to David to new covenant. That is the story of the Bible, right? And we stand now under this new covenant by grace, saved, atoned by blood, saved and forgiven. All right. So that's just, again, just a way of thinking about the story of redemption. But so let's, let's compare and contrast these. Under point four, I say distinguishing the covenants. So here are some categories that sometimes are used to kind of think about the differences between these covenants. So point A, we talk, sometimes we talk about unilateral covenants and bilateral covenants. Okay. Who knows what unilateral means? 
One party. It means the obligation for keeping the arrangement falls on one party. Uh, by contrast, a bilateral uh, agreement then is what? The obligation falls on both parties to keep the agreement. Right? Unilateral versus bilateral. So if you had to look at these covenants under point three, and if you had to identify the ones that were unilateral, the ones in which the keeping falls solely on one party, which ones would you identify? All of them but C. That's exactly right. Because in every one of these, talk, Noah and with Abraham and with David and with the new covenant, God says, this is what I'm going to do for you. And he doesn't say, this is what you have to also do for me. Right? But under point C, under the Mosaic covenant, it was very clear that it was bilateral. Israel had obligations and God had obligations. And both parties had to keep those obligations for the covenant to remain in effect. Yes? For the sake of argument, the no covenant. Uh-huh. So it does have some stipulations, doesn't it? We have the command to be fruitful and multiply, the command not to eat the lifeblood and not to take anyone's life, right? But still, the promise is that God would not flood the earth with in the water in judgment again, right? Correct. Correct. Does that make sense? Okay. So yeah, so unilateral and bilateral. That's one way of thinking about these covenants. Point B, we have promissory covenants and regulatory covenants, right? Promissory covenants are covenants that are based in what? Promise. Based solely in promise. God's promises to act on behalf of His people by grace. Right? By contrast, a regulatory covenant is intended to regulate the relationship between God and His people. Right? So here again, which of these covenants would you identify as promissory and which of them would you identify as regulatory? Yeah. It was intended to regulate the, uh, the relationship between God and His people as long as they lived in the promised land. Right? But even under the new covenant, God promises to regulate His relationship with us, doesn't He? Yeah. He says, I'm going to write my law on your hearts. In Ezekiel chapter 36, the passage we didn't read, He says, I'm going to put my spirit in your hearts. Yeah. Right? So, and yet here, even though it's regulatory, God is still the one doing it. He says, I will put my spirit in you and I will cause you to keep my commandments. Which takes us to the text, chapter 2, that's preached on Sunday. That's right. John, this, this is yeah. what Paul said. And we're going to get there next, this week, coming this Sunday. Come back for uh, Acts chapter 2. Okay, so again, an another way of distinguishing these covenants. Point C, unconditional covenants and conditional covenants, right? Unconditional have no conditions, right? And then conditional covenants have conditions. So you, you can see the differences here. Okay, in terms of thinking about these covenants and their similarities and their differences. Okay, so let's get down here to point five and ask some discussion questions in the time that we have left. We spent a lot of time talking about the story of the Bible, about the covenants God has made with various people. And so point A, I simply say, why does it matter that the God of the Bible is a covenant-making God? That's right. Both of you are correct. God cannot lie. That which He says, He always does. He has kept, He is keeping, and He will keep His promises to the very end. He doesn't go back on it. He doesn't renege on it. Right? I'm sure all of us have had experiences when people have made us promises, and those promises have been broken. And we felt disappointed, and we felt betrayed, and we felt hurt. Right? God never breaks His promise. So when you read the passage in Jeremiah chapter 31 that says, I will forgive your sins and I will remember them no more. That means he will never remember your sins. That they're washed away in the atoning blood of Christ. And he does not remember them. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. Right? That's a promise you can take to the bank. He doesn't hold our sins against us anymore. We're forgiven. And it's because the price is paid. That's right. Blood of That's right. Christ took wrath. Christ was forsaken that you and I never have to be forsaken. Now, if that doesn't cause you to fall on your face, you do not understand the gospel. That's right. If that does not cause you to worship, love, and desire to obey, you do That's not right. understand the gospel. That's right. He took wrath for you. That's right. He was forgotten that we're not forgotten. I think it also teaches us that salvation is uh, the, the, the passage in the Old Testament that says salvation belongs to our God. The initiative belongs to our God. God was the one who reached out in all of these instances to make these covenants. 
It wasn't because people were reaching out to him. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? He reached down to us. He entered human experience, entered human history, and made covenants with people that were as, fail, as, as faulty and as fallen and as weak as you and me. Now how can we believe that? Because he rose from the dead, right? That's right. And it says he ever lives to make intercession for us. Therefore, he saves us to the uttermost. To the uttermost. That's right. What he just said. Yeah. Because God <coughs> is in flesh. We have a high priest we can go to who's touched with all yeah. temptations that we are yet without sin. So he's a high priest that, that can sympathize. That's right. You don't have to run from him, but brothers and sisters, if you believe what he is teaching and what you're hearing right now, it changes things. That's right. It's a game changer. That's right. It's, and not, a, it's not, well, I'm going to do good. I'm going to show up to church and, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to balance things out. And, well, God understands. God understands his son paid wrath. That's right. That's right. God understands that. He took sin. Now, if I understand that, it changes things. That's right. You're either going to be, if you're his child, you'll be so eaten up with sin, it will do with what it did with me where I couldn't look at my fat face in the mirror. That's right. Because I knew the one who died for me. Yeah. Is this good stuff? Here? So, point being that when Paul says, he who began a good work in you will be sure to complete it yes. until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? That's how Paul could say these things. Yes. Because Paul understood God makes covenants and God keeps His promises. Okay, Let's look at the second question. How do these historical covenants help us <coughs> excuse me, understand <coughs> sorry, the story of the Bible? How do these, these covenants we've talked about, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, why do they matter to you and me? In terms of our understanding of the biblical story, in terms of the meta-narrative, I used that word earlier, the overarching story, the one author story of Scripture, how do these covenants help us understand the story of the Bible? Yes. One is the guilt of man is apparent in all over. That's right. That, that there was a problem that God had to deal with, and that was human sin. And that's, that problem still exists today, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Right? The big thing is the grace and redemption. Absolutely. Every one of these covenants are based in grace, aren't they? Noah didn't deserve it. Abraham didn't deserve it. The people of Israel didn't deserve it. David didn't, didn't deserve it. And you and I don't deserve it. So God's involved with His creation. That's right. He's not distant. He's not separate. He's not far off. He is a God who gets His hands dirty and gets in the muck. We live and move and have our being. That's right. He's there. Seek That's me right. while I may be found. Call upon me That's while right. I'm here. And so when we read, when we look at this story of how God has unfolded His plan of redemption, we understand that, that we are part of this story. Yes. Right? Our story of salvation, yes, Miss Vicki, I'm coming to you. Our story of salvation didn't just begin the moment you walked an aisle and prayed a prayer. Your story of salvation extends all the way back into eternity past when God said, I'm going to save him. I'm going to save her. I choose him. And that gives us confidence and that gives us assurance. Yes, Miss Vicki. That's right. 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 At the very least, God has been working out your salvation since He flooded the earth. So, I mean, since before that, but since at least then. Okay, it says Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. That's right. So God made a promise before the ages began. That's right. Who did he promise that to? Well, let's just look over to Timothy chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Jesus. Did this in Christ Jesus before ages began. Yeah. God the Father promised that. That's right. Son. I'm going to give you a people. That's right. I'm, I'm going to give you a gift, son. That's right. Now, son, to receive this gift, you're going to have to become incarnate. And, son, and you're going to have to die. To receive this gift, you're going to have to pay wrath for mm -hmm. their sin. Son, they're, your enemies, you're going to have to pay wrath, son, to receive this gift. But they're going to be yours. And, I'm going to, and the, the Holy Spirit's going to indwell them. And they're going to worship you. And they're going to be like you. Yep. And they're going to be yours forever, son. That's right. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Man. That's when this started. <laughs> They all speak to the other attributes of God too, like His justice. That's right. His long suffering. That's right. His mercy. His love. His love. Absolutely. So let's just Patience. talk, huh? Patience. Yeah. 
Yep. I think we've already talked about this, but let's just talk about the last question. How do each of these covenants apply to the Christian experience today? Why does God's covenant with Noah matter to you? Why does God's covenant with Abraham matter or David? Why does it matter to me and you living in 2024 that's here at this church? You got an adulterer, you got a drunk sailor, you got a man who neglects his wife. That's a good point. Thank God we got a God who forgives because I'm pretty sure I was a drunk man. Now, there was times I did not love my wife as Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. and, and no doubt in my life, there has been the sin of lust in my heart. Yep. Right? Yep. And, and so I thank God for, well, David was a murderer. We can throw that in there. Yep. Uh, you know, that, because it reminds me that these, God's not saving those people who earn it or look good. God that's, redeems. That's beautiful. Exactly. God redeems. How else? That's great. I love it. That's great. How else? How else do these covenants apply? To you and me, January the 17th, 2024, on a Wednesday night. I think it's worth it. He keeps his word now. That's right. He kept it in, or just like the promise to us now. That's right. That's right. God is going to keep his word to you. He's, gonna, he's promised to save you to the uttermost. When you're dealing with sin, when you're struggling with that same old sin that you can't defeat, guess what? God is still going to save you. He's going to be with you. He's going to give you the power to defeat it. He's not going to give up on you. Right? Because he keeps his promise. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think, I think when we look at some of these things, too, we, we are reminded of the passage that says, He will never leave you or forsake you. Because we can look at a rainbow today and remember his covenant to never flood the earth. That's right. We can look at somebody who has just been redeemed and say, There's another one. Yeah. Added to the number of stars. That That's right. Abraham. That's right. So we can say, Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant, hey, here's another one. That's right. right? God is faithful. That's right. When we, when, if we believe the gospel, then we know that Jesus is on the throne. That's right. And, and we can see that from the Davidic covenant. Yeah. And then we, I mean, all these covenants point to a faithful, uh, truthful God who is with us, for us, and That's right. leave us and forsake us. By the time we get to that new covenant, man, if we can look at all these other covenants and see how steadfast he was in those. Yep. He still is a new covenant. That's right. And he's still redeeming people. Yep. Christ is on the throne, ruling and reigning. Yep. Right now. Yep. And even when we look to the future, when we go back and read, for example, the rest of Ezekiel chapter 36, we can see that the promise of a new creation is part of the new covenant too. Right? The hope that we have that one day there will be a world with no sin is part of God's promise that he made in, a new, in a new, the new covenant, Ezekiel chapter 36, 37. So all of God's work in salvation, not only of redeeming individuals, but of redeeming His creation from sin and creating a place where sin does not exist and where we can live with Him in, in complete and unmediated uh, presence. Yes. That's all part of this covenant idea too. So those are covenant uh, promises that God has yet to fulfill. But guess what? He kept His promise then and He's going to keep His promise then in the future too, isn't He? So any final thoughts about anything we've considered this evening? person who is truly a child of God who is living in sin. Yep. And, yep. and I know that by experience, unfortunately. Yep. But he is faithful. He is faithful. You know, don't, don't do what I did and lose 11 years of your life. I lost so much. So, my 40th birthday, people flew from all over the country for a surprise party for me. Because I was following his faithful. Not because I was anything. I don't know why. I know who I am. But when I walk with him in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know how many birthday wishes I got on October 14th, 2023? Two texts. Yeah. What a difference sin makes, huh? Yeah. What a difference. I want, to, uh, I want to close with the idea that I began with, that this story of God and His covenants is a beautiful story. That when we think of what is beautiful and praiseworthy and significant and valuable and worthwhile, right? The way God has worked out our salvation is the most beautiful story that's ever been told. And it should cause us to stand up and worship the one true and living God. And this is how Paul ends after talking about all of these issues. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom 
and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments, how untraceable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? And who has ever given to God that He should be repaid? For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer.